Mr. Uh, Ma for keeping you waiting. We had a technical glitch, but all sorted out. Bismillah rahmani rahim You can go ahead. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's good to be back. I'm going to try and uh, finish as quick as I can. Uh, we're speaking today about Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, radiallahu anha, the warrior aunt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nahmadu wa nasalli ala rasulil kareem. Bismillah rahman rahim. So she's the most prominent of all the aunts of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, paternal aunts. There was Atika, Um Hakim, Arwa, um, Barra, Umayma, and Safiya. And she was about a year or two younger than Hamza, radiallahu anh. So Safiya and Hamza shared the same mother and father. Hamza was born after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father yeah. passed away. So they were about, some narrations say two years, some say four years. But you can understand that being the aunt of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was not much younger than Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, their mother was Hala bint uh, Wuhayb. She was from the Bani Zohra clan. And Nabi Sassim's mother was also from the Bani Zohra clan. They were actually cousins. So their mothers were cousins. And on the same day that Abdullah asked for the hand of um, his son in marriage to Amina, I, I mean, Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib also asked for Hala's hand. So they actually had a double um, marriage ceremony. And that is why Safiya and Hamza are very close to the same age of Nabi Sassam. And also with this, with, with that closeness comes um, a, a more stronger bond between them, between Hamza, between Safiya, and um, between Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Her first marriage was, so, so like her, before I go into her early life, uh, with Hamza, he was stern, he was harsh, he was brave, he was courageous. His sister was the same. And her first marriage to Harith bin Harb, that was Abu Sufyan's brother, older brother. She then married, um, and this was before she had accepted Islam. And even before that, she had married um, Awam bin Khuwailid. So he was the brother of Khadija Ridlana. So you see the closeness of Safiya to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was his aunt and then also married to Khadija's brother. So they were quite close. And they had three sons, a Zubair, a Saib, and another son, Abdul Kaaba. Her husband passed away while her sons were very young. So she had to raise her sons on her own, which is not uh, an easy feat. And she did not want to marry, so she remained a single mother. And she raised the sons with discipline and devoted all her attention to them. She didn't want them to be raised disadvantaged because... In the pre-Islamic age, uh, if you were an orphan, you were very much disadvantaged. Nobody cared much for you. Even in the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when uh, you needed protection, you either needed somebody from a, a higher clan, uh, like Abu Talib took Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in. So she was worried about this for her son, and she cared very much for him, and she tried to toughen him up. It wasn't the right way, maybe, the way she did it, because she was of a harsh nature. So she would, if he complained when he was young and he came in, she would rebuke him or scold him and, and he beat him up. And when Nofal asked, this was a brother-in-law, why are you doing this? Do you hate your son? And she said, no, I don't hate my son. I just, I want him to be a man. I want him to be undefeatable. I want him to be brave and courageous and strong. And I don't want anyone to pick on him. And so in her way she was actually doing this out of love for her son for a Zubair and um, this is the kind of mother he had growing him up so you can understand also why a Zubair was a bit harsh also yet he was one of the Ashram of Ashra one of the ten that were promised Channa and look who his mother was Safiya Radulana so even like we said it was not maybe the preferred way and even in Islam we wouldn't prefer harshness but this was how she was and it was pre-Islamic so it was no wonder that when a son came to her when he was about 13 and other narrations say 18, when he came to her and he accepted Islam, he told her that he had accepted Islam and Safiya Radlan was very angry. She was not Muslim at the time and Hamza, Hamza was not Muslim at the time and she was worried that people would pick on him and so she tried to do everything to stop him from accepting Islam and even telling Nofal to do something to, to stop him. But eventually... Uh, she accepted Islam after Hamza Ridlan. And with the, the Hamza and Umar Ridlan's conversions, it was big for the Muslims. It was a very, very big morale booster. 
So she had accepted Islam after that. And after she embraced Islam, she, she really devoted her life to Deen. She never married again after that. And then by then, Zubair was married to Asma, the, the daughter of Abu Bakr al which is another brave woman. And um, just as we did last week with Nusayba al how she loved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi how she protected Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Safiya was the same. Safiya was walking around with a dagger or a spear or a sword seeking to defend Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this shows you their bravery. Not all women were the same. You know, some women were not as brave. Most women were not as brave. These are, and that's why we're doing the segment, you know, it, it, it's rare to see them. But again, bravery is in many forms. So if we saw a woman like this, like Sophia, in today's day and age, what would we have said? Would we have judged her? Would the men in our time have judged her? Um, or would she have been too much for a man in our time? And I love the legacy that the Sahabiyat and Sahaba Radlanhum leave. The interaction between these brave women, the interaction with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the fact that they were not judged, uh, they were accepted, they were loved, they were praised for their bravery and for who they were. So she's known for her battles in Uhud, in uh, Khandak, and also in Khaybar. And on the, 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 the battle of Uhud, was, it, was a, it was a difficult battle. It was harsh for the Muslims because, not repeating myself, because the archers leaving their posts, and Safiya came on the day of Uhud, and she had a spear in her hand, and she was in the in the middle of the battlefield. And we know that Hamza, her brother, who was the most prominent of the shuhada on Uhud, was martyred there. And Nabi Sassam sees his mart- uh, mutilated body, and he did not want the, his first thoughts were, were to Safiya. He didn't want her to see this, and so he tells her son Azubair that don't let your mother see this. You know, uh, go to your mother, but. I don't want her to come here. And Azubair tries everything to try to prevent her from coming. And every time, when he got there, she had this dagger in her hand. And she was condemning the men, telling them, Amarartum an Rasulillah, did you, why did you flee? Did you flee from the Prophet Wasallam? You know, what is wrong with you? Like, shame on you. And hearing this uh, from Zubair, now she hears that Hamza's martyred. And she just wants to go to the battlefield to see her brother. And out of concern, he keeps saying, oh, ma, you know, my mother, oh, mother, go back. And every time he says that, she tells him, Andi, like, you know, let me be. Just And eventually he says, this is the order of Nabi Sassam. And immediately that brave, bold woman, she says, I hear and I obey. And she, she says, because this is the order of Nabi Sassam, she's going to listen. And what did she say? She didn't allow herself to be overcome with grief or overcome with emotion and just push on anyway she stopped and she she had sabr and she said that I will hope to get the reward from Allah I will bear this with patience is what she said and eventually Zubair informs Nabi Sassim that she knows and he allows her to come to the battlefield and she sees Hamza's body and she stands there for the major portion of the night crying over how she sees her brother's body and you know they were so close she was like not just a, a sister but she's like she's to mother him also and and nurture him and take care of him and she cries and she says inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un to allah we belong and to allah we return and she says As, uh, indak. i'm seeking reward from you allah over this loss it was hard for her and that was a brave thing for her standing there saying her goodbyes to 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 umar and she was actively on the battlefield as well during the battle of the trench she's known the story she is known for her bravery so at the time of the battle of khandak or ahzab it was fought against the bani quraiza and the quraish nabi sasam had left women and children in a fortress to be protected and he had left uh, safia was among these women here and they were left in the supervision of Hassan bin Thabit. Hassan bin Thabit was also from the Bani Najjar like Nuseba that we mentioned last week, Radullah Anha, but he was a poet. He was not a warrior. And so Nabi Sassam also to include him in battle keeps him here to, to look after them. His contribution was his, uh, his tongue, not his sword. And nobody looked down on him. So he was assigned this, not to go out and fight. And there's a Jewish soldier, soldier that creeps up he climbs to peep over this fortress wall and he sees that there's a woman. 
And Safiya looks at him and she tells Hassan Radlan, go and kill him. And Hassan said, I can't do that. If Do you think I can do that? If I could have done that, I would have been out in battle with Nabi Sassam. I wouldn't be sitting here with a woman. And so she goes and she takes a pole and she kills the invader with a pole. And then she asks Hassan to throw the body over. And Hassan says, I'm not doing that. And she takes the body and she throws the body over the fortress wall. And when the rest of the, the Jewish army sees this, they thought, or these two men thought, that there's a big army up there with the woman. And so they left, they retreated. And this, in this way, her bravery had actually saved the woman uh, because there was no, Hassan was with them. And she single-handedly saved this woman. How old was Safiya Radlan at this time? She was about 59 years old. Subhanallah. So that bravery and her daring and her boldness and her tenacity, she didn't spare it even for Allah. And upon the death of Nabi Sassam, because she outlived Nabi Sassam, she was very sad. And she came out in a garment waving and she, she would like to say poetry. And in one of her lines, she says, the day of your death is certainly a day in which the sun is wrapped up in darkness, even though it is shining. She lived in Medina throughout the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Anhu, passed away during the Khilafah of Umar Anhu, and Umar Anhu actually prayed the Janazah Salah over her, and she is buried in al Baqi. May Allah be pleased with her. The lessons that we draw from this, this bravery, I know I went quickly through it, uh, but the lessons that we draw from here is the independence the bravery of these women, the tenacity of these women, despite their age, despite their age, not looking for excuses to say, I'm old, I, I, I can't do this. They never shied away from it. They, they gave it their all despite their age. And there's so many forms of bravery and courage. But I think one of the hardest also is being on the battlefield because the fact that you are on that battlefield what was your state of mind before that to get on there? The bravery and cour courageousness that, or the courage you had to show to get to the battlefield. And these women were not young. Their sacrifices, their forbearance, she had difficult circumstances. I think for me, you know, raising that son on her own, um, and it was a son, and, and doing such an amazing job and being so sincere, your niya is so important that Allah had ac accepted even her grandson, Abdullah bin Zubair, to be Khalif of Makkah. So many years after that, starting with her and these sacrifices that they make, the fact that it starts with a niya and, and action and yaqeen and hardship after hardship, they didn't back down because they understood the promises of Allah. And I think the fact that they were not judged by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is huge for me. The fact that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had allowed, we've seen in the story now with Hassan bin Thabit, which was, he was different. He was a poet. He wasn't a warrior. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't look down on him. We see Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowing Nusayba bin Ka'ab radiallahu anha. We see Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Safiya radiallahu anha. And it wasn't because it was his family. This is how Nabi Sassam was. And this is the example that we should have. And they were not judged. They were lauded. They were praised. They were loved by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I think the story or the segment of these brave women gives so much of courage for her, a single mother, raising a son. And, and we've had segments before and women, single mothers raising illustrious sons. It gives so much of courage uh, to us women. And taking these stories, her bravery in who she was, in using that for the deen of Allah. She was harsh, but she used it for the deen of Allah. Like Umar and who did. Like Hamza and who did. She was brave in that sense, in growing her son up on her own. She was brave in the sense uh, when she lost her brother. She had, I mean, her son had no father. There was no older brothers. And she believed that she could do this, and she did. With Allah's help, she did. So our moral of our story is just to persevere, you know. Um, be who you are in accordance of Sharia. Follow the Sunnah of Nabi Sassam. Believe in the promises of Allah. Don't lose hope. And don't stop your service in the deen of Allah. People may judge you. People may talk. 
um, you may be rejected by many, but know that Allah loves you and you keep your eye on the prize. And that is the pleasure of Allah and ultimately Jannah. It is a hard road for us to follow, but I think these stories, they they give us and the, the stories of our mothers give us motivation to go on. And and that's the lesson that, or, or the last words that I leave you with the story of Safiya Ritla Anha. Shukran, uh, my Ustad, my mentor. Um, that's why I chose these topics because I think sometimes when when females are vocal, then you get put down to say this is not the way. This is not the way that a woman should behave or be in the forefront uh, mm-hmm. in things like that. Because women were never in the forefront. Women are were silent at home in the depth of the dark room in the corner, and that's so. Especially now where we see there are many, many uh, marginalized people all over the world. They don't have voices and we need to be their voices. We need to be vocal. We need to stand up. But when we are active and we take part in it, activism, and then we judge negatively, we judged as, um, you know, we, we, we breaking some laws or we're not conducting ourselves as a female should be mm-hmm. conducting ourselves. And I always wonder, what is that? Where is the yardstick? Because now uh, we see that it's well documented. So whatever you're saying is based, it's well documented. I mean, sure. your sources are there. It's fixed there. It's in books like uh, Woman Around the Messenger. Uh, there's hadith to this effect where they were there. So it's well documented that Allah gave these women this temperament. As you've seen our beloved mother, Safiya Radhi Allah she was a very strong woman in terms of her emotions and her physical strength. Mm-hmm. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam acknowledged that, appreciated that, and he used this personality and this character for the benefit of, for, of Islam. And I think for me, it's about time that we recognize females that Allah has bestowed us with this type of personality that uh, we are outspoken. We have that what they call in Urdu, the Josh in our personalities. And uh, yes, so why do you want to hold us back uh, and and not let us be in the forefront of deen and to speak our truth and that don't bring us down or don't maybe judge us. But I love what you said. And for me, I'm always going to take this as uh, my courage to persevere is keep your eye on the prize. And for me, that prize is uh, not only Jannah, but to be with Allah, uh, you know, to have yes. Allah. And, and that, so, so, uh, so Alhamdulillah, uh, Jannah is there and I want a beautiful abode, but I think the ultimate prize for all a mu'min is to be in Allah's court, in Allah's company, to be directly there, to be invited by Allah, mm-hmm. to be Allah's guest of honor inshallah. in the best of courts, inshallah. So that's the eye on the prize. And if we have sincer- sincerity of Nia and we we do it within the prescribes of Allah's law, then I think personalities like this, all the Safiya, Radiyalo, Anu, the, the, the Nusaybas, the Rabi, Arabia, Basaria, all the, the Sars Fatima Fikriyas of the world. Alhamdulillah, if Allah gave us that personality, then please support us. See what the Nabi seen in the So shukran for this. And I'm looking forward to next week's edition because I, I'm sure you're going to bring another personality who served Dean. Uh, in the forefront as well. So looking forward to that. And Jazakallah for your time. This segment, uh, it's brought in collaboration with our amazing NPO organization, Color, Colors of Hope, and of which you are co-founder as well as director. May you be uh, under the mercy and protection of the Almighty. Until next week, inshallah. Jazakallah khair for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. And we're going to go for a break. Thereafter, another from one phenomenal a sister who is in the forefront of serving humanity, serving Dean, to another sister and a fellow host as well, that is Shaista Token. And we're going to talk about her wiser initiative with a volunteer, uh, Sister Rabia. Let me just get Sister Rabia Bamji as well. So looking forward to that after the break. <laughs> Thank you.